Good morning, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the course so far. I'm going to give you um, an introduction to uh, 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 to pathway uh, analysis. Um, here is our, our Creative Commons uh, copyright. All right, so we're on pathway and network analysis. So uh, the objectives for uh, this morning are to um, understand uh, uh, what is meant by the terms pathway and network analysis. They're thrown out uh, sometimes interchangeably, sometimes not. It's a source of confusion even within the field. Uh, I'm going to talk about where the data comes for performing uh, this type of analysis, go over the three main uh, uh, paradigms people have for uh, performing pathway and network analysis, uh, and then show a, a spe some specific examples of using uh, one uh, network and uh, analysis framework based on Reactome uh, to analyze biological data. And that will lead into uh, the, um, uh, the exercise practical that uh, Robin uh, Hall will uh, lead you through after my lecture. So the, I think this will be familiar to you that the reason that people are interested in pathway analysis uh, is because of the fundamental dimensionality problem that biology has. Um, we have uh, genomes that are uh, tens of thousands of genes. There are 20,000 in the human genome. There are 20,000 coding genes and twice as many non-coding genes. Whenever you look at a biological perturbation, whether it's a disease or a model system, you'll typically find changes in thousands of genes. And given that we can't do tens of thousands of experiments, we're usually doing tens to hundreds of experiments, that means there's a, there's a huge problem with multiple hypothesis testing. So the reason one wants to do pathway analysis is to reduce these changes that you measure in thousands of genes to uh, small numbers, dozens of altered pathways, and then do your hypothesis testing on the, on the pathways. That increases your statistical power, and it lets you find meanings in the long tails that we frequently see in cancer and other diseases. So for example, if you look at autism spectrum disorder, um, you find many, many, many extremely rare germline, germline mutations. How do you make sense of singleton, many singleton events? Uh, another advantage of pathway analysis is it, uh, is it relates the changes that you see to the biology, to biological pathways that people have, a, have worked on for many years, and in many cases have an intuitive understanding for. It lets you identify hidden patterns and long lists of genes that have non-explanatory names. Uh, it allows you to create mechanic, mechanistic models to test your hypotheses with experimental interventions, to predict the function of unannotated genes, something on the order of 20% of the genes in the genome we really don't know anything about. Um, and it gives you a, a framework for doing quantitative modeling, sort of uh, cell, en cell engineering and quantitative prediction, and it lets you uh, develop uh, uh, molecular, robust molecular signatures. So pathway network analysis, broadly speaking, is any analytic technique that uses information on uh, biological pathways or network informations to gain insight into uh, uh, a tumor or other biological system. And I'm sorry, I'll keep talking about cancer because that's the field that I, I work in. It's, it's my go-to. It's a rapidly evolving field. There are multiple uh, approaches. Um, and there's little, little consensus on uh, what the best practices are in, in pathway and network analysis. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about what uh, is the difference between a pathway and a network. So a pathway, um, when, uh, when I use it, and when many people use it, um, refers to the classic type of mechanistic model that we learn in biochemistry 101, where there is an ordered, there is a ordered 
series of events uh, occurring in the cell involving uh, uh, macromolecules, organelles, and other entities that interact with each other in a, uh, in a particular sequence of events to yield a biological, uh, a biological outcome. So here, for example, we're looking at a very simplified version. Uh, where's my, my pointer? Here we go. Push the right button. Wrong button. Ah, okay. Here we're looking at uh, EGF receptor binding to uh, being bound by the EGF lig ligand, uh, creating a, 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 a active dimer. Um, this then uh, 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 hydro hydrolyzes ATP, and it leads to the product of phosphorylated EGF receptor, which then activates downstream events, uh, ultimately um, uh, uh, causing the EGF uh, signaling. It has a series of inhibitors and, 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 reg and other regulators. Um, this is uh, um, uh, the advantage of looking at uh, a path with biological process this way is that you can understand what it's, what it's for and you can imagine experiments in which you alter different parts of this to, to, to test, test your hypotheses. Uh, however, these types of models are computationally uh, very difficult to, uh, to work with um, and uh, also require a degree of, of curation and previous knowledge that often you, don't, often you don't have. So if you focus just on uh, curated pathways of this sort, you're going to miss a lot of biology that's not yet explored. So the alternative is networks. And in a network, you take this fairly complex and highly structured um, uh, pathway and you, you break it down into a series of, uh, into a simpler model where you just have a series of interactions. Uh, so instead of um, this idea of EGF receptor binding to EGF to form uh, a dimer, here we just have, um, I'm not sure I can read how well I can read that, we just have EGF uh, interacting and activating the EGF receptor without you actually knowing how that, uh, uh, what the mechanism really, really is. So there's positive interactions which activate a molecule, there are negative ones that inhibit, and then there are interactions which, uh, where you don't know what the direction is, but you know they physically interact somehow, but you don't know exactly what they're doing. And although this lacks a lot of explanatory power and is less satisfying, computationally it's often, it's usually easier to work with uh, the simplified network view than the pathway view. So is that people clear on that? Maybe I'll speed up a little bit. Uh, so when you do pathway and or network analysis, you basically need two, in, um, uh, two ingredients. First, you need uh, a, um, a list of the genes and proteins and RNAs, other macromolecules, that are altered in your system, because we're typically looking at perturbations, either ones that you create in the lab or naturally occurring ones that, uh, that occur because of a disease, and you need um, a source of pathways uh, or networks on which to do the analysis, your, your reference set. <coughs> so let's talk about where these come from. So pathway databases are the older um, of, these, um, uh, of, these, uh, of these ingredients. They go back to um, textbooks like Leninger. The, uh, there are multiple pathway databases. Their advantages are uh, usually they're curated, uh, often they're created by a, a team of, of cura PhD level curators who are actually manually constructing these pathways and drawing them out for you. They provide a biochemical view of biological processes, um, they ca capture cause and effect, and they give you human interpretable visualizations. They're intuitively easier to understand. Disadvantages are they, they have a sparse coverage of the genome, and if you look at different databases, they will actually disagree at where one pathway begins and another pathway stops, which makes perfect sense because the, the cell isn't organized in cha as chapters in a textbook, um, and where we draw boundaries between EGF signaling and, and RAS signaling and other GDPR signals 
um, is is really a historical um, an historical artifact. It doesn't really reflect biology. Uh, there, uh, re so um, uh, I don't know why these are called reaction network <coughs> databases, but um, pathway databases. Two prominent examples are Reactome uh, and Keg. Um, Joe, uh, Reactome is a database that uh, Robin and I work with. Keg is a very well established and well known uh, 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 database from in uh, Japan. They describe biological databases as a series of biochemical reactions. Um, they use um, uh, so the uh, pathway databases usually use a use a uh, a mo very straightforward model in which the rea a reaction is the center of the uh, uh, is the center of the data model. Uh, a reaction takes uh, multiple inputs which can be anything from a protein to a drug. Um, uh, those two inputs uh, interact with each other in some way to produce, two out to produce one or more uh, outputs. And they may be regulated um, uh, in, in, various, in, in various ways. They may involve catalysts or, inhib or inhibitors that alter the rate at which the reaction occurs. This is a very general model. It can be used for uh, things like a proteolytic re re reaction, where the inputs are, say, ATP and a large protein, and the outputs are ADP and the cleaved uh, protein products. Um, it could be a binding reaction, such as uh, EGF and EGFR receptor, outputting uh, the, dot, the uh, active dimer. Um, or it could be something like um, a, uh, um, uh, a macromolecule that's inside a cell being transformed by a uh, transporter to a macromolecule outside the cell. So it's, it's fairly, fairly ge general. Now, KEG is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes uh, based in Tokyo, Japan, or Kyoto, Japan. Um, it's a... a, a very, very large um, database that, it, um, that includes many other things from pathways. It includes, uh, it has uh, uh, genome sequences, uh, uh, it's a protein, protein database, chemical compound database, and it spans multiple prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The pathway portion of KEG is uh, manually drawn pathway maps that have been created by, um, uh, by expert, expert curators. Um, it used to be a free resource, but uh, more recently, uh, it has, um, because of funding, public funding issues, it's gone to a subscriber model. So you have access to part of it for free. To get access to uh, more, you have to subscribe, and you have to subscribe and pay a license fee in order to, to download. Um, here's a, a, a typical keg pathway diagram will look will look like this, showing uh, a very similar to what I showed you before, showing individual uh, uh, genes in this case, uh, pro, uh, or individual proteins in this case, uh, complexes consisting of multiple proteins, uh, and the reactions that they uh, that they participate in, uh, and their positive and negative. Um, uh, uh, negative relationships. Uh, Reactome is, mo is more focused than, uh, than KEG. It focuses uh, on really on human biology. Um, in contrast to KEG, it's completely open source and open access. Uh, uh, Reactome is able to do that because of uh, continued funding from the National Institutes of Health, which I pray we will continue to get. Um, it is a, a curated, um, curated database that encompasses uh, metabolism, signaling, multiple biological processes. Um, it covers roughly 50% of the coding portion of the genome. Uh, it has uh, just about 11,000 <coughs> uh, 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 genes um, in it as of, the last, as of the last release out of the 20,000 that are known. Um, every pathway is traceable to the primary literature 
um, via the efforts of curators and uh, experts who are brought in to work on each of the uh, pathways. It's peer-reviewed, so every pathway gets reviewed by at least one other outside expert. Um, it cross-references to many other uh, bioinformatics databases, and it provides a basic set of data visualization and, and analysis, uh, analysis tools, ranging from a, a browsable uh, Google uh, map style reaction diagram that lets you zoom in and out and pan around. Uh, it lets you find pathways contain, containing your genes of interest. You can do, do gene overrepresentation, which will be the topic of this afternoon, this morning's uh, exercise. Um, and you can do, uh, you can, uh, although it um, uh, emphasizes human, you can use it to match human pathways with, with pathways in, in other species, including uh, most model organisms. So here is uh, one representation uh, of the, the pathway browser. This is actually a, a hand-drawn uh, uh, hand view. As you zoom into this, it becomes increasingly detailed. And uh, after a cert, if you zoom in enough, it becomes a, a, a pathway diagram with individual genes and proteins being shown. Uh, if you zoom out, you get a more abstract display that lets that um, shows the entire genome and lets you sh uh, show overrepresented um, uh, pathways. Uh, this is uh, in this view. We've actually done a pathway enrichment analysis in which we've uploaded a data set from a um, RNA seq experiment um, in a from a uh, uh, I believe this was a, uh, a, a, a a cancer collection of some sort. And it shows overrepresentation in a variety of signaling pathways. There is a list of the individual signaling pathways that are overrepresented, along with their p-value and false discovery rate here. There's a picture of it showing the overrepresented pathways um, with a uh, little orange bar showing uh, how what portion of the all the genes and proteins in the pathway are covered in your set. And then there's a kind of a hierarchical display of signal transduction and all the, um, the, the sub-pathways uh, sub and sub-sub-pathways within them and their over-representation. Sorry, why would I prefer these over GO or something like that? What? Oh, we're going to go into that oh. in, just, in just a second. OK, so now networks. So path pathways capture only the well-understood portion of biology. Networks can cover. Uh, less well understood relationships, including uh, like genetic interactions from a suppressor enhancer screen, physical interactions, uh, things like CRISPR studies, uh, Go term sharing, uh, co expression networks, uh, you name it, you can put it in a pathway. Uh, network databases can be built by via curation, but more typically they're built automatically from high throughput experiments, such as CRISPR screens, for example. Um, they have extensive coverage of biological systems, uh, but the relationships and underlying evidence are more tentative. Typically, there will be false positives and false negatives in the network, uh, and it's, uh, you have to be careful in understanding how, uh, in understanding the limitations of the networks you work with. Uh, there are multiple uh, sources of curated networks, too, that I want to bring to your attention is the BioGrid. Um, consortium um, that uh, was actually started here in Toronto. It's a series of curated physical and genetic interactions from the literature, 65,000 interaction uh, interactors and 1.1 million interactions. It's quite a large database. And then there is a uh, the Intact database uh, based uh, in the at uh, uh, EBI in the UK. Um, again, uses curated interactions from the literature. It has it's, it's um, a somewhat somewhat smaller, but um, the uh, um, uh, but in general, their st st the standards are a bit higher. Six hundred ninety-four thousand interactions. Uh, just a, a, a look at uh, Intact as an example here. Um, very s straightforward user interface. If you're interested in uh, what interacts with p53. You type the gene TP53 in the search bar, and it'll give you a long list of 11,128 uh, 
uh, uh, molecules that interact with p53, and you can dig into this and identify what type of interact, how the interaction was defined, what the evidence was for, it, and primary literature references. Okay, and then. Uh, 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 I'm going to close out this section by talking about a database, a database of pathway databases, the Pathway Commons. Um, this is an effort um, that uh, Gary Bader, who was here yesterday, um, helped launch with Chris Sanders um, about a, uh, eight, eight or nine years ago um, to, uh, to bring into a single database information from multiple pathway and network databases. Um, there are about a dozen that contribute to this. And it has a, again, a simple interface. You can search for a protein or other macromolecule that you're interested in, and it will list um, all the interactions, um, um, both uh, from network and pathway databases, that have something to say about p53 and give you pointers to the, the source database. So if you're looking for everything that's known about a particular um, uh, a gene, protein, or RNA, this is a good place to start. Then on top, built on top of these databases, there are quite a few uh, visualization tools that let you manipulate um, and, and, uh, pathways and databases. These can become quite large, as you can see. Uh, we're focusing on Cytoscape um, during, this, um, during this class because it's uh, far and away the most widely used of these tools. Okay, so let, now let's go, I'll address your, uh, Liron, right? Yeah. I'll, I'm going to address your question. So there are basically three types of pathway and network analysis one can do, well, uh, that you can do. There's um, enrichment of fixed gene sets. There is um, uh, uh, de novo uh, subnetwork uh, uh, discovery and clustering, and then there's pathway-based systems biology style modeling. So the first and, and easily most widely used one uh, is the one that you discussed yesterday, where you have a gene set such as uh, Go, uh, in which uh, the genes have been parsed into a series of fixed sets, each corresponding to something biologically relevant, relevant such as a um, compar subcellular compartment or a um, or, or biological process. Uh, and then you use a uh, one of uh, many, many uh, enrichment uh, statistic tools to uh, identify, um, uh, to test whether a uh, list of genes that you have is over or upper, uh, underrepresented in one of those, um, in one of those, uh, one or more of those gene sets. In number two, and now we're going to go in over a second what the advantages and disadvantages of each are. The second most widely used style is subnetwork construction and clustering. Here, um, you don't start out with a preconceived notion of the boundaries of your gene sets. Instead, you have something like a, um, a, a, a big pathway or a big interaction network, which has maybe 10,000 genes in it. Um, and you then apply your data set to this network in order to discover um, highly enriched subnetworks within that network. So it lets you discover relationships, biologically significant relationships, which are not previously um, uh, defined by your list of Go terms. And then the last one is uh, pathway-based uh, modeling. Here you start out with um, a, uh, uh, a biochemical style um, uh, pathway network with um, pathway um, uh, pathway with inputs and outputs and a uh, a biological endpoint, um, you apply your um, uh, uh, your perturbed genes to this, and you have it predict what the result is. So, for example, um, uh, if I have a um, um, if I have a cancer cell, uh, a, ca a tumor and I have identified that a, a, a gene has been deleted in this, um, uh, in this cell, um, pathway analysis, will pathway modeling, will allow you to predict what the effect on, um, um, on KRAS signaling would be. 
or what the effect on, uh, on proliferation or contact inhibition would be by applying modeling principles. Each of these has a different, has a different role. So the simplest one is uh, asking what biological processes are altered in this cancer. It doesn't tell you why they're altered or what the effect of the alteration is or even what direction it is, but it gives you the first clue that I'm dealing, I'm dealing here with um, um, neuron, neuron, uh, neurite targeting or axon guidance. Uh, the second is uh, allows you to discover new pathways that are altered in this disease. Here I'm using cancer because this was originally done for a cancer talk. Uh, are there identifying, uh, lets you identify clinically relevant uh, subtypes of the disease based on differences in uh, which pathways are affected. And then the third allows you to, uh, 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 allows you to get at the, uh, at the effect of the perturbations. How are the activities of the pathways altered in this particular patient, in this particular mouse, in this particular cell line? So we're going to go over these now in more, de in more detail. So enrichment of fixed gene sets, such as GO analysis. Uh, it's easily the most popular form of pathway network analysis. And the big advantage of it is that there are mature, well-tested tools that you can apply to this. There, um, as a, because the software is, is good and mature, um, uh, gene set enrichment is easy to perform. Uh, the statistical models are, are, well, worked, are well worked out. Uh, the big disadvantage is that there are many different possible gene sets. You can take uh, you can take Go, which is a very popular choice. You can use pathways. You can take uh, you can take from Reactome or Keg uh, all the genes involved in EGF signaling. Uh, uh, but there are many other possible gene sets, and the the results that you get really depend very uh, very uh, largely on which gene sets you choose. Uh, gene sets are heavily overlapping. Um, if you uh, perform a, um, a gene set enrichment analysis using uh, gene sets from multiple different sources, you're going to get partial overlaps and you're going to have to reconcile that. Uh, I think um, Gary might have talked about uh, might have talked about enrichment his enrichment maps yesterday. Yeah, okay, that's one of the tools that you use for resolving those overlaps. Uh, and um, the other problem is the boundaries. You, when you get, have bags of genes, there are, arbitrary, um, uh, there are arbitrary boundaries between them. And if there are regulatory relationships between, say, two Go processes, that may be obscured. Okay. So de novo subnetwork construction and reconstructing uh, and clustering. Um, the, 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 the basic statistical model um, is given a network of gene or protein interactions um, and a, uh, a gene set that you've developed from a, a disease or, an, or a, um, uh, a perturbation experiment, it will find topologically unlikely configurations. It'll f identify groups of genes that came, up, that came up in your analysis which are interacting with each other more frequently than you would expect by chance. And then from that you can try to pull, pull out a, 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 bio, a, a biological relationships that may not, not have previously been discovered. Um, the, do I have advantages and disadvantages? Oh, should. All right, well, I'll just go through it. The um, uh, you know, advantage of this is that you can discover new, um, new relationships. Um, the disadvantage is it's much, it's much more work. You have to uh, annotate, annotate the clusters and make sense of, of uh, what, what you found. Um, here's an example of doing that using the Reactome FI network, and it's similar to your exercise this afternoon. Um, the Reactome um, functional interaction network is actually a hybrid network that was that um, is based on a core of cura curated pathways from Reactome and other databases, um, and a, a, a set of uncurated but large-scale uh, interaction networks which were then combined using uh, a bit of machine learning to create a, uh, a very conservative um, gene interaction network, which minimizes the number of false positives. 
So it's, uh, as these go, it's relatively small. It's only got 11,000 proteins in it and 270,000 interactions. But we believe that the, the, the rate of false positives is less than 5% in this set. Okay. So very simple application of this is you take the FI network, you apply a set of disease genes to it. And in this case, these are genes which are recurrently mutated in uh, pancreatic cancer. And then you pull out from this network uh, interacting sets of genes which are clustering together in ways that are statistically unlikely. And then when you annotate this according to what pathways have contributed to each of these clusters, you get out a typically biologically interesting clusters. We have one for PI3 kinase, one for P53 and DNA repair, uh, one for um, uh, cell cycle checkpoints. Um, and the, the difference between this and a Go analysis is that these, are, these um, modules are, dis are discovered. So they don't correspond directly to Go, to, uh, Go categories. Uh, and so it may bring in genes which are not annotated as belonging to DNA repair, but we've discovered that in this disease at least, they're, st they're highly associated with other genes involved in DNA repair. Is there a way to verify that? Yeah, then you have to do, then you have to go to the lab and you actually okay. do, you, you know, you start knocking in and knocking out the genes and you measure, uh, you do DNA repair assays using um, RAD, uh, RAD40, uh, RAD40 assays. So yeah. it's only like it's all, this is all hypothesis generation. And, uh, you know, and, and, and people who work, do work in this field know, have the, uh, the double uh, face, the double uh, 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 edged sword of you can get your results really quickly. I mean, this, this analysis takes you know, minutes, but then it'll take a couple of years to get it to the point where you can publish it. <laughs> ah, you laugh. <laughs> you laughed. Did you find anything different? Hmm? Did you find oh, anything I, I, I actually will go back to this data set and show that we found some pancreatic cancer subtypes. Okay. Um, which I, I think were, were, were interesting. Yeah, it was, it's different from what you would get from a Go, from a Go analysis. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, this is just repeating what I said before about the Reactome FI network. Uh, the current iteration is 12,000 genes, almost 300,000 functional interactions, about a 61% coverage of the genome. And uh, the false positive rate is less than 1%, but its false negative rate is about 80%. Um, and that's because there's a lot of biology that we don't that we don't know. And this is just a, a we're just seeing a, a tiny slice of the network here. Okay, so this illustrates the kind of uh, uh, I'm going back to the pancreatic cancer example here. This is a, a slide didn't translate very well, but it's showing the distribution of mutated genes with um, KRAS mutations. Uh, being, appearing in 49 out of 50 uh, tumors, and then there's a long tail of mutated genes that are uh, um, that are uh, mutated in in fewer than five uh, five samples in our set. All right, so here's a closer look at that um, um, uh, at that network map that I showed you before. Um, we've done a little bit of pruning here to make it easier to easier to see showing a number of things that are known coming out, such as P53 signaling. Things which are unknown, such as axon guidance pathways, are mutated in pancreatic cancer. This we actually did get published in, as a Nature publication uh, a number of years ago. It was after quite a lot of um, validation by uh, experimental groups. Um, and you can do interesting, thing, interesting things with this. So if you try to cluster the uh, path, uh, cluster, the tumor samples, just by which genes are mutated, you really basically get no clustering, no clustering at all. Most genes, are, most tumors have KRAS mutants, and then the next most frequent, frequent ones uh, are uh, on, only there in about half of cells. If, however, you cluster um, by to the tumors by um, which, um, which of these discovered network modules uh, are mutated, you actually get um, four 
uh, four types of four types of, of tumor defined by common uh, uh, common altered pathways. Um, there is a KRAS negative one. There's ones that's p50 p53 and uh, 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 DNA repair and axon guidance uh, positive, uh, and so on and so forth. They actually have uh, uh, slightly different histological appearances and uh, uh, a different res different responses to uh, ke chemotherapy. Although it's not strong enough to make a a, a decent actionable signature. Uh, here's an example from breast where we actually got a uh, a good um, prognostic signature out. Here we looked at um, expression levels, RNA expression levels, in uh, estrogen positive um, breast cancers, which generally has a good prognosis. Uh, I did, did, did a similar um, uh, uh, network based uh, clustering and discovery um, and identified um, uh, uh, this module which combines both a cell cycle M phase and Aurora B kinase signaling, um, which is uh, highly, uh, highly variable from one tumor type to the other. And when you um, uh, project this onto patient survival, uh, you find this very nice prognostic signature in which high expression of the genes in this module um, have a much worse prognosis than patients with low expression uh, in the same module. And it turns out that this is um, uh, that patients in this group have um, the same, uh, have a similar survival curve to patients who are triple negative, which is generally associated with a poor prognosis. So we can go into uh, a group of patients who ordinarily would have a good prognosis and would be treated less aggressively, identify those who have um, who are more likely to have aggressive disease and potentially give them a uh, uh, recommend a uh, um, you know a, a more aggressive a more aggressive therapy. So that's a useful case. This would not have been this would not have come out with a uh, with a Go process analysis because Go happens to cut right through this module and individually the two processes don't, don't um, do not add up to a um, to a signature so there are multiple network clustering algorithms um, the ones I'm going to uh, pull out are uh, gene mania which is a collaborative um, uh, algorithm uh, an algorithm developed collaboratively between Quaid Morris and Gary Bader um, it uses a birds of a feather principle in which you provide it with uh, a few genes that uh, are um, that you're interested in, and it will identify other genes which are more closely related to them than you would expect by chance. So it pulls out it'll pull out clusters of related genes. Its great advantage is that it has a, a, a wonderful, easy to use web interface, very convenient to use. Hotnet, which was developed by Ben Raphael at Brown, now at Princeton, um, uh, is a, uh, uh, another very popular algorithm. What it does is it models the network as a metallic lattice of little ball bearings connected by wires to other ball bearings. Um, and uh, it introduces hot and cold nodes. If your gene is overexpressed, it makes that ball bearing hot. If it's underexpressed, it makes it cold, and then it propagates the temperature across the network. Uh, it, so it finds uh, related, sets, related sets of genes and turns individual hot um, nodes into hot and cold areas of the network. Um, it's unclear why that physical model has anything to do with biology, but in practice, what it does is correct for biases in, uh, in annotation. So, for example, p53 is so well studied that it's got more connections than all the rest of the genome combined, just because it's been studied so heavily. Um, however, in this model, because it has so many connections, hot p53 diffuses very quickly around other genes, and so it doesn't have the disproportional impact of the network as it would have uh, as uh, uh, more naive techniques would use. Um, there is a uh, uh, a network uh, analysis module built into Cytoscape called Hypermodules that is specifically, uh, specifically designed 
to find network clusters that uh, correlate well with clinical characteristics. So it tries to explain differences in, in some sort of phenotype, such as uh, aggressive cancer versus indolent cancer by finding uh, network clusters that associate with that. It's specifically designed for signature discovery. Uh, and then there is the uh, Reactome Functional Interaction Network Cytoscape app, which uh, actually takes uh, multiple clustering and correlation algorithms, including a uh, hotnet described up here, paradigm that uh, I'll describe later, and this uh, survival correlation analysis that we use to discover the breast cancer, give you a sec, breast cancer uh, signature, and lets you do it in an interactive user interface. Yes, you have a question. Um, how many samples or cases do you need to make this worthwhile? Is it, are you talking about hundreds or thousands or tens? Um, nope. Typically, to get, to get statistical uh, significance, you need hundreds of samples or perturbations. The more you can do it on as few as, say, 50, depending on the effect size. Okay, other, other questions? Yeah. Oh, is this one right? Yeah. Uh, those numerical values are the. Um, I'm trying to remember what they are. Um, it's a it's a weighted it's a weighted score um, uh, from zero to one, um, corresponding to the number number of patients who have a uh, or uh, it's the num it's. Uh, it's the number of genes in that module um, which are mutated in that specimen. Okay, so if all of the module is, uh, if, if all the genes in the module are mutated, it will be a, uh, it'll be one. But it's been weighted, it's been weighted, it's been weighted for the frequency with which that gene is mutated in, uh, in the population. Yeah, module is yeah. This is each of each of these groupings is a module. Uh, we weight the module by, by weight each gene by the frequency with which it's mutated in the um, pancreatic cancer population as a whole. So um, I can't really see that. But I think that's KRAS. Yeah, that's KRAS. The big orange, the big greenish guy is KRAS. It's very frequently mutated, so it's large. And the, um, the index is the weighted average of the, num of the number of genes in that patient that are mutated uh, by the frequency with which it uh, occurs in the population, so that more frequent, more frequent genes get downweighted. The yeah, the, uh, they're actually determined by the same uh, by a. Um, spectral clustering method. That's the same uh, method used frequently to um, analyze social media networks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, now we're going to talk about pathway-based modeling. Okay, this is the um, um, uh, this is the method that has the greatest, uh, provides the greatest explanatory power. It's also the hardest to do. Um, here you apply a list of altered genes, proteins, or RNAs to a biological pathway. Um, the model preserves the biological relationships uh, uh, among them, so it doesn't conflate a kinase, re a, a kinase reaction with a proteolytic, a proteolytic reaction. Uh, it, uh, it tries to integrate multiple molecular alterations together to yield lists of altered pathway activities. So for example, if I have a uh, cancer, cancer uh, uh, tumor that has a EGFR uh, amplification and an inactivating KRAS mutation, okay, so EGFR has exerts its, its downstream effects via KRAS. Um, ordinarily, EGFR, uh, an EGFR amplification will increase the EGFR uh, uh, pathway activity. KRAS, um, uh, however, if KRAS is mutated, that will counteract it. Okay, so 
in pathway-based net modeling, you would present both mutations to the model, and it would tell you that in this case, EGFR is not activated, EGFR pathway is not activated, even though the receptor is amplified. Is everyone following that somewhat arbitrary example? Okay, great. So it, it, it tries, when you have a complex um, system, and in particular cancer, each tumor will typically have somewhere between four and six, four and ten um, driver mutations. It will tell you how they relate to each other and try to predict the, the network activities. Um, it easily shades into uh, systems, systems biology. The types of pathway-based modeling that's out there uh, are, are very varied. Uh, there are uh, classic systems biology, uh, biochemical uh, syst um, models that use partial differential equations. Cell net analyzer is uh, an example of this. Uh, they're mostly suited for uh, biochemical systems, such as metabolomics. And the, uh, the modeling is very computationally intense, typically. Uh, you're talking about pathways that aren't larger than a few tens of, uh, of, of genes or macromolecules, maybe up to 100. There are um, network flow models um, in which, which use information theory to propagate changes through a series of positive and negative regulatory relationships. Um, they're mostly applied to kinase cascades. So the in the world of kinase, uh, kinase cascades, net forest, and network kin are used. There are ones that are, that are specialized for uh, modeling regulatory networks in the transcriptome, such as um, uh, arachne from uh, Andreas Califano at Columbia University. And then there are various graph models, probabilistic graph models, Boolean graph models, um, such as Paradigm, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, which are a very general form of pathway modeling and are, um, are increasingly being used for uh, cancer analysis. So I'm going to give an example of this. Uh, this is Paradigm. It was written by uh, Joshua Stewart and David Hausler at UCSC um, about six, seven years ago, um, widely used in the cancer field. And what it does is it uses the central paradigm as its, um, um, as its framework, um, allowing it to model simultaneously changes at the gene, protein, uh, and RNA levels. Uh, so here's a simple, here's a simple pathway. Uh, P53 activation leads to apoptosis, and it's inhibited by MDM2. In practice, you'd have a much more complicated one. What Paradigm does is that breaks that down into this, this simple pathway suddenly becomes much larger because it has nodes for the gene, which creates the RNA, which creates the protein, which is then modified um, to uh, become the active protein, um, which uh, P53 has a parallel, um, uh, a parallel regulatory relationship. Gene is needed to create the RNA, which needed to create the protein. And then the MDM2 active protein inhibits, there's a little box here, uh, the, the active P53 protein. So you can then introduce um, from a single um, uh, cancer, uh, uh, cancer uh, 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 tumor analysis experiment every perturbation you found. You, if you have you've done whole genomes, you've done genome sequencing. Uh, you have a series of mutations, and some of them inactivate MDM2. You can model that. You can measure changes in the RNA, a transcriptome, uh, and model ch um, increases or decreases to the, at the RNA level. You can model copy number changes affecting uh, P53, so uh, P53 deletion. Or you could add uh, really arbitrary information, mass spec on the P53 protein. And then the model will integrate all these together and tell you what the effect, the, the uh, anticipated effect in apoptosis is, which you can then go in and verify, and they'll try to verify in the lab. Uh, it's been widely used to discover cancer subtypes. It's basically a more sophisticated version of the reactome FI network subtype discovery that I showed you. Here it is applied um, in uh, uh, 2010 
to uh, a, a TCGA glioblastoma multiforme a data set. What we're looking at here are patients going down, individual patients going down the columns. Each patient has multiple um, uh, RNA uh, expression changes and uh, DNA-based uh, uh, copy number and point mutations. And what we're seeing on the rows are what Paradigm predicts for, uh, net, for pathway activities in the GATA pathway, uh, EGFR pathway, HIF L1 alpha pathway. And you can see that the patient, there are multiple distinct clusters of patients that are distinguished by, between differences in their inferred pathway activity. Um, and that is uh, these because they're integrating multiple sources of information, it means that you can see patients who have a uh, who have GATA pathway inactivation cluster um, clustered, even though they have different, very different uh, uh, molecular changes. They might have a mutation. They might have a methylation-induced RNA change. Uh, they could have a delete, an amplification, or a deletion. The good and bad news about Paradigm is that the Paradigm algorithm itself is has been made almost impossible to uh, for people to run. It's not distributed any longer um, because it, they they made a company around it. Uh, they, it doesn't, they never distributed any pathway models. The, the documentation is scant, and it takes a long time to run. Uh, the good news is that uh, Reactome FIV's Cytoscape app uh, re-implemented Paradigm. Based on the out, based on the published algorithm, we include reactome-based pathway models, and we've um, improved performance so that it can be run uh, in uh, in hours to days rather than uh, weeks to months over the uh, compared to the original version. Right. So um, that's uh, basically out of time. So uh, I'm just going. I just a few pages at the end of your handouts, which gives you links to the tools that um, uh, I've mentioned here, um, and um, we're going to take a um, quick. Uh, uh, we're going to take some questions and answers, and then go into our coffee break, and then have um, and then have the practical.